without further ado, let's go and get back at it. So we left off, we talked about how we have our four different energy systems where we've got ATP, PCR, anaerobic glycolysis, aerobic glycolysis, and beta oxidation. First two are anaerobic, first the second two are aerobic. So we're talking a little bit more about the basics with glycolysis. So we talked before about the anaerobic one, now we're going to the aerobic. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that pyruvate, we're going to get to the end, and then we're going to turn it into acetyl-CoA by removing a carbon dioxide and removing some hydrogen. And then that two carbon molecule is going to go into the citric acid cycle. And from there, which the citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondria, we're going to be able to generate a lot of NADH, FADH2, one GTP that is immediately converted into ATP and carbon dioxide. So once this occurs, we can take the products of that NADH and FADH2 and send those into the electron transport chain which after going through the five different complexes where we effectively create an electrical chemical gradient that is all caused by protons being shifted from the matrix to the intercellular membrane, we are in turn going to be able to get a lot of ATP. So glycolysis itself, remember guys, is only gonna net us a good two to three ATP, three if we're starting from glycogen, two if we're starting from glucose because of the activation cost. However, all of that NADH and FADH2 is going to generate ATP, and that's where we're going to get the major energy gains at the end. Okay, so that is for aerobic breakdown of carbohydrates. The electron transfer chain and the citric acid cycle both occur inside of the mitochondria of our cells. Now we get into beta oxidation. This is going to be using fats as fuel, and fats are going to be broken down into well, initially, we have triglycerides, so we have a glycerol and then three fatty acids attached to it. Then those individual fatty acids are what we're going to be breaking down, cutting off two carbons at a time through what's known as beta oxidation. We're going to generate an acetyl-CoA, an NADH, an FADH2, and then that acetyl-CoA is going to go through the citric acid cycle, just like happened with glycolysis, and that's where we're going to get a huge net of energy. Now, once we go ahead and keep, that's just for two carbons at a time. Example, palmitic acid, where you've got yourself a grand total of, I believe this one should be uh, at least 16 carbons, you get to go through and do the citric acid cycle eight times, because it's two for carbon, or two carbons through each. Whereas with glycolysis, since we chopped that glucose into two, we're gonna go through two rounds. Hence why the energy yields for breaking down fat are so, so much higher. However, this enzymatically is slower. Beta oxidation occurs in the mitochondria. It is a slower process, which in turn still uses those aerobic systems. It just can't use it as quickly. To the tune of, you can really only produce energy anaerobically at about two thirds the speed that you can do it with your aerobic production of breaking down glucose. So we also are going to potentially use fats a little bit as a or protein as a fuel, but that's very, very rare. And that's really only occurring during starvation. And it's fascinating because due to the R group and the differences you're going to naturally find in protein, some of them are going to be able to be converted into intermediates of glycolysis. Some of them are going to be able to be converted into intermediates of the citric acid cycle. And then some are just going to be able to convert it all the way into glucose. And whenever we create new glucose from either glycerol, lactate, proteins, we refer to that as gluconeogenesis, or converting into acetyl-CoA. Now, it's really, really hard to figure it out because we've got nitrogen that we're going to be naturally breaking down all the time from just protein being metabolized and utilized for a number of different roles in the body. Therefore, we're not really gonna ever consider this to be a major contributing factor for your exercise performance. Now, all of these systems are all being controlled by negative feedback. And specifically, the major limiting one is gonna be the, the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. This is going to occur with a couple different enzymes, the major one being isocitrate dehydrogenase. This is going to be up earlier in the system where we're going to go ahead and effectively, if we stop this, we don't allow the cycle to occur, but it's gonna be right after uh, citrate, so it's going to allow things to move on a little bit more thoroughly. 
folks, I will be right back. There is one thing that I have to go ahead and take care of. So this is going to be just like phosphofructokinase from glycolysis, where it's naturally going to be that rate limiter. This is going to keep us from using the electron transport chain when we don't need to, and we're not going to be turning over more calories than is necessary. The equivalent of when we think of the human body using energy, we want to kind of think of it like a car. If we don't have to have the car on to where it's using fuel, we're going to be able to make that fuel tank last a lot longer. So we're trying to minimize the use of energy for as long as possible, okay? And this is going to be inhibited by high levels of ATP, which makes sense. If you have a lot of energy available, you're not gonna use things you don't need to. Whereas if you've got low energy availability, you in turn are going to make sure that you're gonna go ahead and produce more, AKA there's gonna be higher amounts of ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So if you understand this slide, folks, you understand the basic flow chart of how we're going to be shifting and moving the different macronutrients from our intestines, so it's digestion, from our liver, so that's storage in the form of glycogen. And then obviously they're gonna be freeing up energy from our fat stores, along with transporting oxygen around. So depending on how intense our exercise is, how long you've been exercising for, we're going to be utilizing, remember, more of those glucose for fuel or more of that fatty acids for fuel. And if we have that lactate left over, which is lactate's fascinating, so it's a fuel source, it's not a waste product. Lactate, once it's produced, can be broken down by our other type one muscle cells, so maybe adjacent to the type two muscle cells that are producing them. And this actually goes through our um, monocarboxylate transporters uh, one and four, and those isoforms are gonna be related to the muscle fiber type, yay science, and then lactate also will go in the bloodstream. We're gonna be used by any other slow twitch muscle fiber in your body, including your heart. Your brain likes to use lactate as a fuel, and then you can always convert that lactate through gluconeogenesis back into glycogen. So make sure you understand how things are flowing through in this figure, like I said, if you understand it, you've got a pretty good idea of how these energy systems are gonna kind of work together. So let's put it all together. There's an inverse relationship between how fast we can get this energy provided and then how long it's going to last for, okay? So we can get energy really, really quickly from our anaerobic systems, specifically phosphocreatine is the fastest by far. However, it's going to last you in a best case scenario, I'd call it maybe about five seconds. And then after that, welcome to the pain. Now, whereas you can also get a decent amount of energy produced from aerobic glycolysis compared to anaerobic, so you can kind of see that about two thirds speed. So hence, once we run out of our stored glycogen as fuel, or we're just very low on those stores, that's what they refer to as hitting the wall if you're doing uh, long distance running, marathon training, anything along those lines, and your performance, once again, is really going to uh, fall apart. Now, keep in mind, guys, also when we're looking at these energy systems, at the same time, we are never doing these in a bubble. We're always going to be utilizing every single energy system, the key is which are we emphasizing the most. So right now, you guys at rest should be mostly emphasizing your beta oxidation, a little bit of aerobic uh, carbohydrate metabolism. Your red blood cells do not have mitochondria, so they have to use anaerobic glycolysis for energy. Your brain really likes glucose as a fuel, so it's using carbo, uh, carbohydrates as a fuel aerobically. Anaerobically, they refer to as a stroke. That's a bad thing. Same thing with your heart not using energy aerobically. That's called a heart attack. We don't like that. But then you're going to be using always a little bit of that phosphocreatine. Uh, the key is, once again, how much are we emphasizing the one or the other? It's never going to be in a bubble to where you're only using the one or the other. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is obviously not all muscles are going to be able to do aerobic performance as well. Big factor is enzyme activity. So do we have enough of the enzymes in these cells and where they have this effect? And that's going to come down to a certain amount of genetics, but a lot of it's going to come down to training. Then we're going to have our natural fiber type composition. So if we're naturally more of a type one individual, we're going to have a greater amount of mitochondria. We're going to be utilizing fuels aerobically a lot more. How you are training on top of that, obviously, is going to be another factor. If we're doing a lot of high intensity power work, but we're making it more of kind of a aerobic training stimulus, which is quite possible to do. If you guys are ever interested, you're more than welcome to come drag a sled with me. It's miserable, but it's fun misery. 
And what you're going to find is by tapping into those bigger type two fibers, you're actually gonna help increase mitochondrial uh, genesis where you're literally gonna help create more mitochondria in the cell. So you're literally going to increase the work capacity of those cells. A high resistance cycling is another version. And if you guys are interested in look up Mark McLaughlin, he's got some interesting ways of applying it. Uh, I've done a, that type of style of training a number of times. Uh, whenever I was um, when I was coming back from my shoulder surgery and I wasn't allowed to do much so I was like well I might as well do really fun uh, aerobic work and by fun aerobic work I mean dragging heavy sleds and cycling against high resistance and now on top of that we have obviously how much oxygen we need and how much we have available so if we don't have as much available as we need we're going to naturally start to utilize more anaerobic processes in those cells now it's really important to understand that we all have a variety of muscle fibers and it's the fibers that you recruit or the fibers that you train. So back to that size principle of tapping into all of our muscle fibers, we can go ahead, uh, McLaughlin, M-C-M-A-U-G-H-L-I-N, -M uh, Mark McLaughlin, he's a strength conditioning coach out of, I believe, Washington. And so, what we're going to find is if we've got a greater amount of these enzymes, we are going to in turn be able to have a greater amount of turnover. So just because you have a lot of type one fiber, you don't have a lot of those enzymes related to the action you're trying to do in the cell, you're not gonna have the same effect. We like representative enzymes because they're pretty indicative of how much of those different enzyme activity levels you're going to have inside of your cell. And so that's why looking at cellular levels of succinate dehydrogenase or citrate synthase sometimes seem as their acronym SDH or CS. And that's gonna be a relatively decent indicator of, okay, what's the aerobic potential this individual has. And as you become more and more well-trained, you're going to increase that enzymatic number. Now we all have genetic predispositions for certain amounts of these. And then we also have genetic predispositions for how adaptable we are. <clears throat> what that means is we all have a natural baseline. And then from there, we also have a natural amount of response. So some folks have a high baseline, but not a lot of response. Some folks have a lower baseline, but a huge potential response. And that's where we have that intersection of both genetics and the wonders of training. So type one fibers naturally tend to be much better at aerobic style training. <laughs> Our type two fibers are much better at using anaerobic glycolysis as well as ATP PCR and what we're going to find is if we do enough training of any style we're going to start to see the fiber type start to express more characteristics of the energy systems that we are predominantly training in and once again it's the muscle fibers you're recruiting so we're going to always start with our type 1 fibers and then as we go up higher and higher intensity then we're going to tap into our type 2 A's and those type 2X if you're naturally training super high intensity all the time, you're gonna be tapping all of your fiber types and you're gonna to start to see that transition from 2X more into 2A, which is fine, along with, depending on the energy systems you're implementing, well then we're gonna see that shifting more towards one or the other. So if we are willing to put in the work, our body's going to change, but it takes time. And that's where your aerobic adaptations or some of your more long-term, hard fought for and hard earned, but those training uh, changes tend to stick with you for much longer than some other types of training. So as our intensity goes up, we need more oxygen. So what's that mean? Well, it means we're going to have a greater break of a or greater rate of ATP breakdown, greater intake of oxygen through the lungs and delivered around through the body. And we can't really store oxygen. Uh, marine animals have a greater amount of myoglobin in their blood. That's why like seal blood and other animals can have like brownish blood. And so they actually literally can store more oxygen for a longer period of time inside of the bloodstream. For us, it's, you know, entering and leaving is gonna be relatively consistent and you can do certain things with hyperventilation otherwise to kind of really saturate out your O2 levels. If you guys are interested in some of like the more uh, intense methodologies that you can use in order to kind of play with more of also tolerance but physiological abilities to carry oxygen. You can look at people that are competitive in free diving, which seems like a great way to naturally select yourself, but I respect anybody that's willing to do something that crazy. Um, if you're not familiar with what free diving is, just Google it, specifically competitive free diving. And what I like to think of when I'm looking at the energy systems 
is, I think of it as a pyramid, okay? The base of the pyramid is aerobic beta oxidation. That is the thing going on in the background, and if that ever fails you, you've literally ran out of body fat, and you're dead because you starved to death, essentially. Now, from there, we've got aerobic glycolysis. That's gonna be made up of our blood glucose, our glycogen in our muscles, which can only be used by that muscle, able to be moved around thanks to the Cori cycle. And then we've, well, plus, yeah, some modification of alanine, you're going to have your anaerobic glycolysis, so that's using those carbs far less efficient, efficiently, but they give you a greater amount of energy potential. And then finally, we have our ATP PCR, which is the top of the pyramid that is the greatest power output, but it's going to be a much more acute ability. Now, obviously, when I'm drawing it, this was just an easy way to put it up in a slide. But the way it's really going to look is the pyramid is going to be wider and then kind of uh, taper up to a pretty fine point at the top. So let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and stop the share and I'm going to move this over to speaker view so I can see my crazy person here a little bit more. So if we're looking at this triangle, guys. It's gonna look more like this. So depending on how you're training your athlete, you're going to be shifting the way that this works. Now, my advice for really any single athlete, and this might come as a surprise just looking at me, but Personally, I think just about every athlete you ever encounter can always gain something from increasing their aerobic base. So if we're able to widen this up, so increase the total potential that someone has aerobically, we can in turn increase the size of the pyramid because they're going to have a little bit higher performance there. Now, like anything else, we still need specificity. So if our goal, now thinking about this pyramid, and I want you guys to go ahead and put it in the chat, if we're trying to work with a cross-country athlete, which energy system is going to be the most important one for them to really work on? Good, which of the aerobic? Yeah, pick one. Good, John. Aerobic glycolysis. That's where you're pretty much living if you happen to be a long distance runner. Now, if your goal is to be something like a Olympic weightlifter, what energy system are you really living in, especially whenever you're competing in your sport? Good buddy. Thanks, boss. You just let me know if they're all there. I'll work on putting it away once I get done lecturing. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, but folks, which, okay, glycolytic, good. But if you're going to be an Olympic lifter, what's the major energy system you're using when you're competing? Yes, Braden, ATP, PCR, Olympic lifting, it's single effort, maximal movements. You should be getting that done in a relatively short period of time. Now, if you're gonna be someone who runs a 400 meter, what energy system are you gonna be emphasizing the most? So that's effectively the one maximal lap of sprinting around the track as fast as you can.
anaerobic glycolysis. Great job, Braden. Exactly. So now, life's not that easy. In reality, you're going to use, remember, every single energy system, every system, every single energy system at the same time. The key is what are you emphasizing? And if you guys want a better version of this, I got a video up on the YouTube uh, site. I think it's un, um, it's not in a specific uh, playlist. You can just kind of look through, and I kind of go into it a bit. That'll maybe help you guys see it graphically in a couple different ways. But here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put you guys into a breakout room or breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to go four different rooms. You are to then chat and talk with one another. And we're going to come back together after about 10 minutes. And I want you guys to tell me what energy system are you going to use for your sport? Okay, so sorry. What? So what energy system are you using for your sport percentage-wise? So that's going to be playing the sport. Then, when training for the sport, and how would amateurs and professionals maybe be different? So I want you guys to throw up in chat some sports that you think might be fun. And don't pick something really easy like I did earlier, like, you're gonna be a marathoner, like aerobic, cool, done. You wanna be a weightlifter, you're gonna ATP, PCR, cool, done. What, what sports do you guys wanna look at? And I'm putting up the instructions in the chat so you guys can copy that on your own documents so you can see it. Ooh, I like it, guys. Okay, so we're gonna go basketball, boxing, hmm, and then let's go ahead and go soccer. Yeah, let's go. Group four, gonna be, uh, and then football. So if you get put in the group two, you guys have got basketball. If you're in group three, that's boxing. Group four is going to go and be, sorry, group four is soccer. And then group one is football. Okay, guys, you're about to go into those groups. So go ahead, unmute yourself. And then I want you guys to go ahead and chat yourself with your group members to figure out what's going on. And here we go.
How are we doing, guys? Good. Cool. We think we're done. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Well, sounds yeah. good. I was just uh, – give me a second. I'm going to check with the other groups one more time, and then we'll uh, have you guys back together. Okay. So – we're going to hopefully get it. There you go. So no matter what, my video is going to be up there. But go ahead and let's have one person per group. Go ahead and tell us what you guys came up with for the percent for each of the energy systems you're using. And then, you know, we'll figure as we practice our game and then we'll kind of talk our way through it. So what percentage of each are you using? Go ahead. Uh, let's start off with the soccer group just because I wrote it up there in that order. So we said that our athletes during um, the game would use aerobic glycolysis. Um, and then for training, it would probably probably be still more aerobic glycolysis. Um, and in drill, it would be some anaerobic glycolysis. Um, Percentage-wise, we said that it would be like 90% aerobic and 10% anaerobic. Um, and amateurs would probably be, be more aerobic due to the fact that they might not go as hard as a professional. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and we said professionals would um, definitely use more aerobic, but then maybe when they're trying to score, use some anaerobic. Okay. Okay. Not bad, guys. So let's go ahead and let's, let's break this down a little bit more. Now, when we say, you know, we've got all these systems. So if you're playing soccer, I could see how we would think maybe, let's say 60% of this is gonna be aerobic glycolytic. You'd have maybe 10% beta oxidation and then figure you're gonna go about 15% and 15% for the rest of it. Okay, for so that would be the in, in the game idea. And I don't think you guys are wrong there. In fact, if anything, these numbers can probably be a little bit lower. These two would be a little bit higher because think about watching professional soccer. There's people sprinting off to the ball. Those are the ones that are on the camera. What are the other 20 athletes on the field doing during that time? Jogging. Or? Or going after, going after the ball. No, this isn't her. No. This is professional soccer. They're going to be jogging or what are they going to be doing? Standing. standing around or walking and that's definitely going to be living in this area does that make sense to you guys yeah. so when you're talking about practice practice is probably more demanding on our energy systems here and it's going to be you're going to have less standing around because you're going to be getting in reps after reps after reps Whereas when you're playing the sport, there's certain parts where you're jogging, certain parts where they're walking, certain parts where you're sprinting and running, but you're not going to be doing that without taking a break. If anything, what we're probably going to see is if we had a figure 30% between these two, this would probably be closer to 20, this would be closer to 10. Because at what point in a soccer game as an athlete are you sprinting outright for more than 10 seconds if your team's good? Does that make sense to you guys? Cool. So when you're looking through the energy systems, good job on figuring out what was the big rocks, but then understanding how all of these are contributing and how we need to keep in mind, like what's really the demand of the sport? Most of the sport of soccer is you know, walking, jogging, or standing. It's really what it is. But don't get me wrong, you win and lose the game on how fast you can sprint and recover from those sprints. And you need to have a really good aerobic base in order to do that. So now let's go ahead and talk about uh, brain damage ball. Okay. Oh, and yeah, we'll come back to it, but go ahead. Brain damage ball. What's, what's that sport mostly made up of? Our group, uh, we talked about how depending on the um, position that you play to, it could also affect your energy systems that you use. So like receivers will use more like aerobic glycolysis, but like 
So for our, like, I guess our average, we said playing, it'd be about 50% ATP PCR for those short bursts of energy because football mm-hmm. plays usually don't last that long. Yeah. And then we said 20% for anaerobic glycolysis, 20% for aerobic glycolysis, and then 10% for aerobic beta oxidation. Okay. Now, first and foremost, great job highlighting the fact that it's going to depend on your role in the team. Now, how long does your average play last in brain damage ball? We said usually under 10 seconds. Yeah, if I remember correctly, the average is somewhere between four to seven seconds. That's, that, that definitely sounds like pretty much living in the ATP PCR system. Okay. However, how long are the recoveries? You'd have anywhere from about under 25 seconds. True. To what's the normal play clock? Is it 30? I'm not. That's okay. I don't really pay much attention. I'm not exactly sure either. But the same thing, you, can, you have timeouts, you have a lot of other things going on that increase the rest periods. And that's also, let's face it, after the influence or the offense either scores a point or turns the ball over, they're off the field recovering. So most of the sport of football from the kickoff to the end of the game is actually going to be probably living more in aerobic glycolytic and beta oxidation. Now, when you're actually like, when the ball's hiked, absolutely correct, guys. ATP, PCR, and if the play goes really long, maybe like a kickoff um, or otherwise is going to be anaerobic glycolysis. So with those athletes, with the games that is, you have to keep in mind, we need to be able to recover these systems and specifically the ATP, PCR, which means we need to have better aerobic glycolytic abilities. Kind of weird when you think about it, of most of football is actually standing around. Now, the other component to keep in mind is that's the games. Now, how is football practice going to be different than the games? There's quite a bit of emphasis on aerobic glycolysis, and there's a lot of on lifting itself, so the ATP PCR. So Just think about you're going to be doing a lot more repetitions without a break whenever you're actually practicing the game as opposed to playing. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Okay, thanks, John. I appreciate all of your contributions. Here. So. All right, now let's talk about men playing shapes and women playing shapes. We said about 45 to 50 of aerobic glycolysis because they're doing a lot of running up and down the court you Mm -hmm. just have those like small moments in the paint where you're using more force Mm -hmm. but most of it is running up and down the court dribbling balls trying to get to the net yeah good um i i don't remember the statistic exactly guys but i did read uh, a pretty interesting thing on do you guys know what the average speed like land speed of LeBron James is during a basketball game? Wasn't it like upper 20s? That's peak speed. His average speed is three miles an hour. Most of the basketball game, LeBron James is walking. So. Sounds about right. (laughs) Not the amount of points that he he scores, but the big key, I like how you guys pointed that out. Most of the sport is going to be you know, jogging or walking up and down the court. Now, don't get me wrong, when you got to make a move or otherwise, that's where we're going to be tapping harder into the AP, ATP, PCR, and anaerobic glycolysis. And then during timeouts, we're talking beta oxidation. But good job there, guys, where you're, you really did a good job of uh, looking at those. Now, the one thing I would add is what type of defense would you guys think would be much more – anaerobic glycolysis intensive yes man and not just man but what's another one we could do to make it even more severe because your coach hates you or wants you to be in really good shape full court press man defense nice job yeah good good job guys so that's where you got to think tactically 
And the same thing, and I'm sorry we didn't talk about this during the sport of football, but think about a no huddle offense as opposed to your traditional huddle run the clock offense. That's going to be different metabolic stress on your athlete. So how you train them and how you condition them is going to be very important there. So now go ahead, guys, and our final group, let's go ahead and talk our way through the joys of punching people in the face. Uh, we didn't really break it down into percentages, but I mean, if we did, I'd probably say that uh, anaerobic glycolysis probably takes up anywhere from like 70 to 80% of like one whole round because it's just kind of, you know, running, like they're kind of just like, they're kind of just like, you know, like matching each other, going around in circles pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then I would say that like, anaerobic glycolysis would probably take around another 10% when they're throwing jabs and stuff. And then the ATP would probably be, I don't know, five, because that's like power jabs or power hooks and stuff like that. Yeah, and we had that little conversation on the tactics there. That is absolutely could be, is a good point. Now, really think about it. The rounds are three minutes each. Your anaerobic glycolytic system, best case scenario, only lasts you for two minutes, and it hurts like an MF to try to last that long. So most of boxing is going to be anaerobic glycolytic. But the big, the big point that I really like that we brought up, guys, is it's not, we think of, I am using ATP, sorry, it's like, no, 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 no. Individual fibers and individual muscles are using certain energy systems. So when you're playing the sport of boxing, your legs are pretty much, should be really staying aerobic the entire time. You're never really trying to jump in the sport of boxing. Don't get me wrong, you're trying to translate the power from your lower body to your upper body, but it's going to be more ATP, PCR, or aerobic glycolysis beta oxidation. It's our arms. That's where we're going to see the difference between being anaerobic, aerobic, and beta oxidation. If my arms gas out, specifically well, biceps and anterior delts, my defense becomes this. This is not going to end well for my face, much less the rest of me. So no matter what, I have to have the aerobic base to keep my guard up and to be able to protect myself, aside from obviously just running away. Now, the ability to throw a punch and the amount of power you put behind it, that's going to come back to tapping into the ATP PCR system, anaerobic glycolysis, and depending on obviously how hard you're trying to hit the person with your body's abilities. So a good way to understand this in a very gross way, that meaning you can really you got a solid shot of throwing up, but go out to a track and maybe have a friend time you or otherwise, and you sprint as hard as you can. And don't stop until you've ran one mile. Your speed initially is going to be really good for probably about the maybe first 100 yards or 200 yards. And then you're going to be slower and you're going to be in a lot of pain. And then you're going to be even slower than that, and you're still going to be a lot of pain, but then you're going to be pretty much running off of just aerobic glycolysis. And if you did that for like an hour and a half, plus or minus something from there, then you'd be running off just beta oxidation and you'd still be in excruciating amount of pains, but you'd only be moving about two thirds of the speed of that previous speed because you'd literally feel yourself drop out that ATP PCR energy system and then we're dropping down and we're dropping down and we're dropping down and we're just getting slower and slower and slower. So we want to be able to tap into that top speed, but then come back and recover, tap into that top power, speed, et cetera, come back and think of it on a muscle by muscle basis. I'm sorry for going over guys. Have a great day. Please get going. If you're already late to your next one, well, you know, some of you I know got in-person classes, but I think a lot of you guys are online. Do you have any questions over energy systems before we wrap for the day? Will you put the numbers for like the percents for boxing like you did the other three? Like, yeah. like, will you write that down? Yeah, Catherine, don't think of this as like a end all be all think of this more as a thought exercise but at least want to try to give you guys some numbers to really kind of think about you know how this works and the other thing guys and we touched on it with football we touched on it with basketball which is tactics if you are mike tyson back in the day when you knock out somebody in less than a minute you only have to live in these two energy systems who gives a damn about the rest you're done but if you're somebody that has to go the limits and go a long period of time you're going to go over here. Braden has a question over the energy systems for a 400 meter swim. That is going to 
your distance swimming is kind of the rule of thumb they use is take that and multiply it by four and it's about the same energy demands for that distance of running. So AKA it's about a mile's worth of running. So you figure you're gonna be living mostly in the aerobic glycolytic system, but you're gonna be obviously tapping into the anaerobic glycolytic and beta oxidation. So I'd probably go with like a, I don't know, 30, 40, or sorry, 30, 50, 20, and you could always shift it more one direction or the other depending on what you need to do. But we're gonna keep digging into it and kind of looking into the way that we apply it. Any other questions that I can help you guys out with? I had a question about top 2X fibers. So like the top 2X fibers are larger than the other mm -hmm. types. And so like that would mean they have more mitochondria. And so like, nope. if you have, nope. no, nope. it does not. Nope. The okay. size of your muscle fibers has nothing to do with the amount of mitochondria. In fact, that's one of the worst things about getting to be a bigger muscle in that as your muscle gets bigger. Okay. So man, great question, bud. I don't know if I haven't told you guys this yet. My little sister has her uh, master's in fine arts and she has her bachelor's in fine arts. I do not. So if we have, this is an untrained muscle fiber, this is a trained muscle fiber. Each of them have two capillaries, okay? Notice, thanks to those two capillaries, we actually have less oxygen flow to the bigger muscle fiber relative to its size than the smaller one. So you're now, yeah, you're more powerful than you were before, but you're also gonna gas out a lot faster because you don't have the aerobic capacity. And the same thing can occur with mitochondria, where if each of these cells has one mitochondria, well now look at how underpowered Man, it kind of looks like I drew like a weird alien face. How underpowered that uh, type 2 fiber is. So size only has to do with the amount of force you can produce. It does not mean anything with your ability to tolerate fatigue. And if, it, if anything, you're more likely to fatigue faster. So part of the adaptations from aerobic style training, which we haven't gotten to yet, but it's a great question, which is you're actually going to increase the amount of capillaries if you're doing it right and increase the numbers of mitochondria. So then effectively this fiber would outperform this fiber aerobically. But that's only if we have the energy system adaptations and the blood flow to the fiber improve. Questions guys? Does that, does that answer your question? Am I just doing a really bad job? Uh, you just gotta take the quiz before class on Wednesday, Cody. And we've covered all the material that's gonna be on it. So do yourself a favor, study your notes, study the slides, take a look at the chapter, chapter homeworks, and then uh, take it when you're writing. But remember, you guys only get to take the quiz once, so make it count. And then after we're done, I'm gonna save this and upload it to the YouTube so you guys can watch it at your leisure and uh, rewatch certain segments if you want to. I imagine that is a good thing. I don't know, I'm getting old. So yeah, stay safe out there guys. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.